my life to you, I give shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. The title of our study is The Foolish and the Wise Men. Today, as we continue the Gospel of Matthew, we'll see that Christ is the fulfillment of of prophecy and um, Matthew is quite a prophecy buff and uh, knows a lot of prophecy and so we'll see again there's a lot of scriptures that um, he'll reference that point back to the Old Testament and uh, we'll be taking a look at some visitors from the east coming to worship Jesus so with that let's jump right in and we'll take a look at the first six verses here now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired, of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. We'll pause there. Now, I know some of you have already got your Christmas tree up and your nativity decorations up. I hate to burst your bubble if you have that already done, but the wise men actually didn't show up till much later. Um, and that's a common misconception that the wise men visited Jesus at the manger or at the stable uh, when he was born. But verse 1 tells us this took place after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And we see in verse 2, they're asking, where is he who was born? So they weren't there at the birth. This takes place after the birth. And uh, they show up later on as we'll get to see when we get to verse 7. Uh, the location is different as well. Now these wise men mentioned were royal astrologers, or as the Greek reads, magi. Uh, they were members of the priestly caste in Persia. They were experts in astronomy and astrology. And being from the east, uh, they most likely uh, traveled about 800 miles to come to, to worship. And uh, they had most likely also studied the prophecies uh, that the Jewish people had. Daniel and others that went into exile. Um, when the Jews were exiled from Judah and Israel centuries before. And so they probably... Uh, had read the writings of Daniel and, and come to know uh, the prophecies of the Old Testament. And as they appeared in Jerusalem, they probably had a large entourage. Queen. They gained probably quick access to Herod's court. As you imagine, people from the east coming in, the king's going to hear about it. The king wants to talk to him. And so they see they come to Jerusalem and, and come to see King Herod. So who is this King Herod guy? Well, he's also known as Herod the Great. He was kind of a legend in his own mind, kind of a self-appointed title. Uh, he was only about four feet tall, so he wasn't a very tall guy, but he liked to do tall building projects. And so he built the aqueducts, he helped part of the, the temple there for the Jewish people, built a lot of the infrastructure in Jerusalem. He liked to do great big things. Um, he built a complex uh, with fresh water next to the ocean. He also built a complex on top of Masada. Um, so he liked to do these big projects, and, um, but he was evil, an evil guy in his politics, his taxes, his, his cruelty to people. He was a very paranoid kind of guy, constantly on guard that someone's going to overthrow him and, and take his rule, especially from his own family. 
And so he killed all of his smarter children and his wives, which kind of tells you who he's left with, right? Um, they thought that they might overthrow him. Augustus, the Roman emperor, said it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. That tells you something about this guy, right? Rather be one of his pets than one of his kids. He was that paranoid that someone was going to take that power from him. And so he was getting really upset to hear that there were people from the east coming, and they weren't coming to worship him. They were coming to worship a king, a king of the Jews. And so when the men came from the east to inquire the birth of the king of the Jews, he was really troubled by it. And we see he asked the chief priests and the scribes, what do you know about this? What do you know about this prophecy? And we see in verse 6, they quote a prophecy. And this comes straight from uh, the Old Testament and the book called Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. And in the context of this prophecy, they understood the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, that he was to be a ruler of the people of Israel, who would shepherd Israel. So they understood the Old Testament was pointing to the reality that the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem. And as I was praying and reading the scripture over and over again and just thinking about these scribes and these Pharisees and these wise men, I thought, you know, it's so interesting and, and sadly that these experts, these scribes and these Pharisees, and they knew the prophecy. The Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. You have visitors from the east coming to inquire, where is he? And yet we see the chief of the priests and, and, and the scribes uh, they seem personally uninterested in meeting the Messiah for themselves. We don't see them following the wise men to go with them. And we see that, um, sadly, they're in essence part of the foolish group um, in this chapter. Well, next we'll take a look at Herod's response to all of this. And we'll pick up in verse 7 and we'll go through verse 12. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search carefully for the young child. When you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. We'll pause there. Now, you may be wondering, what's up with this star? This is kind of an interesting star that guides these guys. And evidently, the star appeared to the wise men while they were in the east. Right? They could see this, this sign in the sky. They left Herod. Uh, Herod to go to Bethlehem and they suddenly see the star in the sky again and they rejoice. There, it's over Bethlehem which is about six, seven miles away and so it's guiding them to this place. Now there are a lot of different suggestions about this star. Um, what is this star? What's the origin of this remarkable star? Some say it was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn uh, that were in the sky. Others say there were some planetary things going on in the sky. Others suggest a supernova. Some think it could have been a comet or that God had specifically created a unique star or a sign just for this event. It's called the Star of Bethlehem. There's a lot of speculation um, about it, but whatever we know, we know from the scripture that it was significant enough that God used that to these astronomers and astrologers to guide them. It was something that God used to bring them to Jesus Christ. And also, this was fulfillment of Numbers 24, 17. It says, A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. 
And so this was widely regarded by ancient Jewish scholars as a messianic prediction. Now, what's also interesting here in verse 9 is it says that this star, in the latter part of verse 9, stood over where the young child was. Uh, One of the theologians I was reading about, Adam Clark, said that this is more literally stood over the head of the child. In his thinking, this is the idea of this star-like shown associated with the head of Jesus gave rise to the halo in ancient medieval art. So, intriguing. Yet we know Isaiah 53, 2 tells us that Jesus had nothing outwardly majestic that would attract this to him, right? You would, you would know that, right? If you saw a young child walking down the road and there's a halo above his head, you'd think, there's something different about that guy, right? So most likely that was not the case, right? But there was some significant star in the sky that these wise men were able to, to say, there's something different. Let's go investigate. This must be point us to something that God has for us. And also show, notice here when the, the wise men show up, again, they're not showing up at the manger or at the stable or even in, in Bethlehem. But what does verse 11 say? They show up at a house. And so the family had now found a suitable home uh, to live in. It had been many months. Some say possibly almost two years since the birth of Jesus. And also notice that Jesus is not called a baby. He's called a young child. Likely, what I would estimate, about 18 months. And so we see the wise men, they also brought gifts. These magi brought these three gifts, gold, indicating Christ's future reign, frankincense, indicating his priestly intercession for people, and myrrh would indicate his coming death and sacrifice. So these three gifts have given rise to the tradition that there were only three wise men. Um, there could have been more, and probably was, this, this, this entourage that was with these guys. Um, skit guys have a funny video about the fourth wise man that brings hummus and chips. I encourage you to Google it. It's pretty funny. You'll get some good laughs on it. Um, but uh, so there could have been a fourth guy. We don't know, right? Um, but we see the gold symbolizes kingly role, frankincense, his priestly role, and myrrh, his sacrificial death. So even as great as these magi from the east were in the eyes of men, they knew that this child was even greater. Even God with us, Emmanuel. And so what do they do? They fall down before this child and worship him. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and seen this take place. I mean, can you imagine this? Here are these guys, probably decked out in their garments, bowing in reverence before a young child. And Jesus receives the worship. Why? Because he's God. He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. It's interesting, the Greek word here used for worship is pros, proskaniso. It means to kiss the master's hand. It could also mean to bow in reverence before the king. And that's exactly what these wise men do. They, they bow before the king of kings. We also see they're warned in a dream not to return to Herod, because Herod really didn't want to worship him. He had other motives, as we'll see about next. But, uh, so they depart to go home another way. But we'll see, they're not the only ones that are warned about Herod in a dream. We'll see there's someone else that's warned about him next. And so we'll pick up here in verse 13, and we'll go through verse 18. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. 
Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. We'll pause there. We see that once again, Joseph has an angelic visit and has a dream that God communicates to him um, that it's time to flee to Egypt for Herod is set on destroying this child. And so as I was thinking about that, I sometimes will get the question, well, if God communicated to them through dreams, does God communicate to us through dreams? We also at the same time need to realize at that time they did not have the completion of the Bible, where we have that complete canon, we have the scriptures for us today. And so God doesn't have to use dreams and visions. He can. Um, but we need to realize that he can communicate to choose however he wants to, ch to communicate. We see even the Old Testament he communicated through a donkey, right? So we don't want to put limits on what God can and can't do. However, it is important we make a decision we don't base that decision off of a dream, right? You could have had something spicy before you went to bed. Who knows? We want to filter everything through God's word. Make sure it lines up with what the scriptures say, right? We want to filter everything through God's word. So not against dreams, not against visions. God gives those to people. In fact, if you talk to people in the Middle East, especially during Ramadan, many Arab people, many Muslims come to faith in Christ because Jesus comes to them in a dream or vision, reveals himself, and they realize, I'm heading the wrong way. I need to learn more about this Jesus, and they come to faith in Christ. So God can work through those things, right? And so any dream or any vision that we get from God should point us to him, right? It should bring honor and glory to him. Again, we want to filter everything through the word of God. So Joseph is obedient to God. They would go to Egypt and stay there until Herod's death. And it fulfilled the prophecy that's mentioned here in Hosea uh, chapter 11, verse 1 from the Old Testament. It talks about how the nation of Israel was called uh, to come out of Egypt. Remember, God had used Moses as a deliverer to lead the people, uh, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. They went through the um, desert, wandering for about 40 years until they came to the promised land. And there's this picture uh, that the Messiah is going to be doing something similar. He's going to be delivering the people from bondage and setting them free. And so we see that picture here coming from Hosea. That even as Israel came out of Egypt, so would the Son of God. That he would come and the Messiah would set them free. Now we're not told how long they stayed there in Egypt. There are different opinions. Some say it was as short as three or four months. Others I read said it could have been six or seven years. I don't know. We don't, we're not told, but we know they were in Egypt as Herod went crazy. And we see that in verse 16, what he, how he responded to all this. It says he commanded that all the boys who were two and younger to be killed in that area. And this comes from him inquiring diligently what time the star appeared to those wise men. Again, it's interesting, the wording here. It says in verse 16, Herod, when he saw that he was deceived, well, he was already deceived. He didn't really want to go and worship Jesus. He deceived the wise men, right? So he is self-deceived, and he has alternate motives on wanting to, do, uh, wanting to see the child. He, he doesn't want the child to live. And so we see that he's determined what time it appeared, and from the wise men, it must have been less than two years. And he, uh, like many others throughout history, have tried to prevent the Messiah from coming. We see that at the time of the birth of Moses, right? Uh, Egyptians were uh, 
uh, had the, the, the law that they were to take the baby boys and throw them in the Nile River. God protected Moses through that ordeal. Um, we see that the case with Herod. He was trying to do that as well. We see that also with uh, um, Haman in the Old Testament where he wanted to destroy the Jews and Mordecai and Esther. Uh, God were able to use. We see that with the Holocaust that happened as well. So even right now with Hamas and, uh, and there in the south and um, Hezbollah in the north are trying to take out the Jewish people, you can't stop it from happening, right? God has a special plan for his people, and especially at that time because uh, they, they could not prevent the Messiah from coming. And so as much as he tried, the truth is you can't outsmart God. You just can't, right? If he wants this to happen, it's going to happen. And, and God protected Jesus and kept him safe. And at the same time, we see there was this great loss in Bethlehem. As verse 18 says, there was weeping and there was mourning. And we see this picture of Rachel. Rachel was uh, Jacob's loved wife, and um, she died in Bethlehem, but their descendants were still associated with this town. And this quotation, it comes from the Old Testament as well. It's Jeremiah 31, 15. It originally, in the context, dealt with the mourning of the people as they went into captivity as a nation that the mothers were crying, they were weeping as they saw their family being taken away from them. But here we see Rachel's representation of Bethlehem's mothers um, in the sense that they're losing their children. And so we see there's this near and this far fulfillment that is, is prophesied and fulfilled. What's also interesting in Jeremiah 31, uh, verse 16, he exhorts them to refrain from weeping because the slain children are safe with the Lord and shall come again from the land of the enemy. We need to realize that death is a result of mankind's rebellion against God. Right? When mankind rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, the result of that was death. And it's interesting, the Hebrew word there is, um, you shall die dying. It's a double word. And so there's a physical death, but then there's a spiritual death. And Jesus came to rescue us, right? He came to restore that fellowship with God that we may have life and life eternal. But there's going to be a second death where there's that eternal separation from God forever. And, and so Jesus wants us to be with him in heaven, with him in paradise, and not in the place called hell. So we see that it's difficult that we have death and war and sorrow in this world. But we need to know that sorrow and grief do not have the last word. Either in Jeremiah's time or in Matthew's time or in our time. And even if a mother is going through such heartache that she refuses to be comforted, God will comfort her nonetheless. The loss of a child is difficult, very difficult. But God is greater, and God can comfort us with the hope and the peace that only he can give. And the truth is, God always wins. I don't know about you, but I've read the last book in the Bible. I want to see how it all turns out. If you want to, I would encourage you to. It turns out okay. God wins. He's going to restore everything. He's going to bring that paradise, that garden back down to earth. And we're going to live in peace for eternity with our King and King and Lord of Lords. And so if you're a follower of God, you need to know that. God always wins. And God's going to restore and make everything good once again. Well, we'll continue on. Verse 19 through verse 23. We'll see that Joseph is going to receive another uh, command from the Lord. It says, Now when Herod was dead... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. 
And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He should be called a Nazarene. We see in this last section that Joseph received another command from the Lord uh, that he should return to Israel for Herod is dead. And so Joseph apparently intended to return back to Bethlehem, uh, not far from Jerusalem, where they had been living before their quick flight to Egypt. But he hears that Herod's, one of Herod's son, again, as I said, he wiped out his smart children, which means you're left with your not-so-smart children. And this guy was incompetent, but he was a very violent, deranged guy. And um, so he was afraid to go there. And it's actually interesting, history shows us this. Um, Josephus, um, one of the historians of the time, wrote that it took the plea of the Jews in Judea for the Romans to demote this guy for misrule. And so they took him out of his power and replaced him with somebody else uh, as a governor appointed by Rome in A.D. 6. So that tells you kind of the, the family legacy that this Herod guy left behind. It wasn't pretty. So Joseph then receives information from the Lord. Why don't we reroute you? And he takes his family back to Nazareth, which is where Mary's family was from. They had been there before they journeyed to Bethlehem. And so they're heading back now towards the city of Nazareth. It is interesting here. In verse 23, it says that this might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. I got to say, out of all of Matthew's references and the whole gospel of Matthew, this is probably one of the most interesting ones. And I'll tell you why. There's no specific passage in the Old Testament has the given words, he shall be called a Nazarene. I looked. I, I, I don't find it. But I also found this really interesting. Of all the references that Matthew quotes from the Old Testament, all the other references use the singular. The prophet said. This is the only one I have found where he uses the plural. The prophets, more than one. So it would seem that he's summarizing a lot of the Old Testament, that they're all saying this about the Messiah, that he would be someone who would be despised and rejected of men, as Isaiah 53 says. Now, there are some commentators and that have suggested uh, that this could come from Isaiah 11.1, 1, where he's called a rod. The Hebrew word there is netzer. It's uh, out of the stem of Jesse's family tree. Or Isaiah 53.2, the Messianic reference states, he grew up before them as a tender shoot. And the Hebrew word for shoot is very similar to the word Nazarene. Yet, at the same time, it's remarkable that Joseph would come back to Nazareth, a hometown of Mary where everyone knew the circumstance around this particular birth. Again, if you weren't here for chapter 1, I would encourage you to, to read chapter 1 and see the circumstances around this. Um, and so we know that later on, in John's gospel, John 146, uh, Philip and Nathaniel were talking about the Messiah. Nathaniel said to Philip, can anything good come from Nazareth? And uh, it's an interesting question. At that time, Nazareth was about 150 people. It was a small town, didn't have any city walls, had no protection, must have had some sort of a bad reputation. And so it's like, I don't want to name a town here, but it would be like, you know, that town, those people. Like, when you're going to pass through that town, don't blink, because you'll just go right through it. I know it says you need to slow down, but just keep going, right? It's one of those towns. That's the town that Jesus chose to live in to dwell with. And so the answer to that question is, yes, God can bring something good out of Nazareth. And God can bring forth beauty from ashes. And so in God's plan, Jesus comes from this small, insignificant place. If it had any reputation, it was a bad one. You didn't want to be known, oh, you're from that town. Interesting. And yet Jesus chose this place to grow up with 
to choose to identify with these people, showing us that there's no one out of his reach, right? That he can go as low as humanity can go to rescue us all. So in closing, we see that people here they had three different responses to Jesus. First, we see there were people like Herod. They displayed open hatred towards Jesus. Right? They don't, they don't want to worship anyone else. They want to worship self. They don't want to worship Jesus as king. And there's people like this today. There's hostility towards God and hostility towards anyone who would want to follow Jesus as king. And there's a second group, people like the chief priests and the scribes. They're indifferent towards Jesus. Yeah, they know about Jesus. They follow him on social media. They like his things. They like the scriptures that are out there. And they watch some of the movies he's pretty cool in, right? So they know about him. And I think that's a modern part of the world, or I'd say most of America today. But they kind of keep their distance, right? When Jesus says, follow me, well, I kind of want to do my own thing, right? And so we see that group of people. They, they want him to be savior, but they don't want him to be Lord. And then we have the third group of people, people like the wise men. They sought out Jesus. They came to worship Jesus, even at great cost. Traveled 800 miles, one-way trip, all then all the way back to come and worship the child, to come worship Jesus. And I believe with all my heart, this is the group that we're in, right? that we have come to seek Jesus. And once we know Jesus for who he is, we can help but do anything else than worship him, to fall more in love with him, and surrender our whole life in service to him. Right? To live our life as a sacrifice, as that gift, as, a, as something that he can use. And so my hope is that none of us here are foolish in these first two groups of people, but that we're like the wise men, and we're here to follow Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word together. And Lord, as our hearts are just encouraged, knowing, Lord, that you are here with us, Emmanuel, that you chose to come to identify with the, the lowest of us, Lord, the bottom of the barrel. That's us. To rescue and save a wretch like us. Thank you, Jesus, that you would come to do that work. And Lord, we pray that as we partake of communion today together, that our hearts would just be further stirred and encouraged, Lord, to know the great love that you have for us. And Lord, we pray if there be any here this morning, or maybe on the first or second group of these people, we ask God that today would be their day of salvation. And if you're here this morning, as every Christian is praying, every head is bowed, and you say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with God. I need to surrender my life to him. I'm ready to worship Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. If that's you this morning and you're ready to make the decision, I want to encourage you to, to make that declaration in your heart and your life to follow the Lord. And based upon God's word, you become born again. God will come and take up residence within you and give you a new heart with new desires. He'll clean you up. And he'll change and transform you. And so if you're ready to do that, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and truly mean it in your heart. God, I realize that I am a sinner and that I've been running from you. Today, I turn my life over to you. I realize that you love me, that Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins that you were buried and rose from the dead. God, would you forgive me of all my sins? Come into my heart and my life today to 
be my Savior and my Lord, to be my King and my God. Help me from this day forward to follow you, that you would put your spirit within me, that I may do your will. God, I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me and adopting me into your family. And I thank you for being my Savior and my Lord. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Christ or maybe a rededication, coming home as a prodigal, I'd love to encourage you after service, give you some resources, pray with you, give you a Bible if you don't have one. And just You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries, check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. life to you I give shout from the inside